the second talk this morning we have in here we have Douglas Reith. He's from Philadelphia, Philadelphia originally. He's a PHP developer with an interest in architecture, infrastructure, and design patterns, and now he's an advocate for open source development, as he's pro he finds it's proven to be both an important foundation for innovation as well as a source of innovation in its own right. He's going to talk to us about repetition, <laughs> learning how to do it. Yeah, Douglas. thank you. Um, look, I just want to start by saying I'd like to pay my respect to the traditional and original owners of this land, the uh, Muwi Nana people. Um, I want to pay my respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal community who are the custodians of this land. Um, so thanks for coming along to my talk. Um, now, about me, um, not all... Uh, uh, presentation transitions get a go in every, pre every presentation, so I've decided to give them all a go. Um, so I like to use random presentation uh, transitions. Um, I like uh, the introduction there. Uh, up until about um, four years old, I lived with penguins. Um, they used to live under a house at Phillip Island, and I guess there's no wonder I like Linux. Um, now, a little bit more about me. I'm the uh, tech guy at Engagement Innovation. Um, Engagement Innovation, we have set up this site which is all about getting feedback for businesses. I'll just quickly switch to that if I can. Maybe I can't. Because I just want to give you some context about me. So this is basically us. It's a, it's a way of connecting people and businesses for positive change. We've got an app, we've got a back end, we've got a whole lot of other properties that are going on. Um, so check us out, download the app. If you just search for Glowfeed, you'll find it. Now what's this about? <clears throat> well, I hope to start off with that you're interested in software development, that's why you're here. Um, why are we at Open Source Conference? Well, uh, we use open source frameworks to get where we want to. Uh, and I also believe that sharing is an important part of uh, being open. So I want to uh, share our knowledge or share my experiences, and that's part of the reason why we're here. Um, so this is about software development and a way of thinking. So <clears throat> now I've given something similar to this presentation at PHP Melbourne's user group. And I did get a few blank stares in the audience. So for this presentation, I've taken a step back a little bit. Um, <clears throat> if you saw that Prezo, I'd, I'm not sure anyone who has, but you'll still get a lot from this presentation or supply more context. Um, I do recommend, and I refer to it later in the presentation, that to go look at my other presentation as well. That will get into more technical detail. But with this one, we're stepping back a bit, taking a look at the higher level and getting to know why we're doing these things. So here's some basic truths. Now, language, I'm not talking about programming language. I'm talking about the English language or whatever languages you speak. Um, <clears throat> to start off with, we're wired for language, right? Our brains are wired for language. Um, there's, uh, is it nurture or nature? For a long, people, long time, people thought it was uh, uh, nature. Sorry, nurture. Um, people thought tabula rasa. Uh, like Locke, we thought that our brains are blank when we're born and we build up language over time. Um, now there's a lot of evidence to show that our brains are already wired, so stuff like um, Steve Pinker's book on the language instinct. Now, <clears throat> another thing about language is that we, we play language games. So basically, this is a, a proposal by Wittgenstein, another philosopher. Uh, you can see that philosophy is a bit of a interest of mine as well, but basically we, um, we play language games, we have membership, so in this developers conference all the things we talk about is a way that we um, bind with other people, we talk about uh, all these terms that will come up, some in this talk, but in other talks as well, and so these are things that our brains are really good at doing, so this is something we should exercise more. Now, <coughs> the other truths about software development change is constant. Um, again, this is from philosophy, it's been there a long time. Now, okay, to be fair, I'm in a startup, so the rate of change is really high. Um, but, and software becomes stable over time. 
Uh, it doesn't, nef but it doesn't necessarily stop changing. So especially at the start, let's say that the stuff is changing, but also with agile development methodologies, this means that this is even increased. So basically the idea is you design quick, short parts, you build it out. So the idea that change is coming and it's always happening is even accelerated with the agile methodology. Whatever you design at the start is not going to be there later on as it is in the code base. Stuff will change. And your code base will grow. That's pretty much guaranteed. Um, you might be building something which is maybe a device driver or something like that, something very, very specific. Perhaps some of these things go away a bit. But any other application, I think, from an app, for, for even a library, anything, your code base is going to change. It's going to grow. What are we trying to avoid? We're trying to avoid the big ball of mud. Um, basically, this is a situation where adding new stuff is hard. Uh, people that are joining your organization, they find it hard to understand the system, to reason with it, to get a grip. Bugs come in easily, and you can't get them out. This is what we're trying to get rid of. It's really hard to reason about this system. So what do we do? Well, other people have already fixed it. You know, new Linux, for example, lots of binaries, lots of authors, lots of little things. Um, how do they do it? And it's, sorry, it's not a new problem. This is good, the transitions are going well. Um, <laughs> no, you've heard this all before. Interfaces, contracts, um, isolated behavior, high internal cohesion, low external coupling. We've all heard this before, but it seems still hard to do. So, <clears throat> building an application, it's still hard. It takes time and resources. And even though we've heard it before and we know all about these practices and what we're supposed to do, it's still difficult to do. We don't have the time for design. What can help us? And this is what I'm promoting. I'm promoting these patterns that can help us um, with, the, uh, with the issues of time and resources um, and getting your design right right from the beginning because we just know that's hard. So domain-driven design, that's the triple D. So from that website, it says domain-driven design is an approach <coughs> to develop software for complex needs by deeply connecting the implementation to an evolving model of the core business concepts. Um, <coughs> now for me, I think in a new project, you are gonna underestimate complexity. Um, so going back to the point about agile methodology, we're gonna add stuff over time if there's any longevity in the project, unless it gets put in the bin, right? <coughs> so I think this is wrong. Um, I think it's for developing any software, not just for complex needs, because the thing is, you're not gonna know how complex it is later on down the track. Now, it also says it's an evolving model um, of the core business concepts, right? So I think what they're trying to say is not model of the core businesses, it's like it's a model that will evolve to match the core business concepts. I also sort of, it's a bit hard to know where, which way they mean with that. But for me, the business itself will evolve. So that's a big thing you've got to understand. So your code will have to change and your model will have to change. So <clears throat> we can invest a little bit or we can invest a lot. And I think if we invest a little bit in these type of patterns at the start and earlier on, it's going to help a whole lot. Now. The other thing they talk about is ubiquitous language. So this is some of the terminology, some of the language games that come out of domain-driven design. Sometimes I find that they're probably not uh, necessary, but if you get, if I sort of excite you and you, you want to get involved a bit more in this stuff, this is what you'll find, and I'm just scratching the surface. But ubiquitous language is agreed terms that are well-meaning and consistent within a banner context. Now this is my interpretation of what ubiquitous language means. Uh, agreed is important. It means that between myself and somebody in the business uh, or somebody in marketing, we use the same word. We agree on a word and we use it and we stick to it. It's consistent. So that means when I write a code, the code I write, the word is the same in my code as the one I've talked to in marketing staff. It's a, it sounds like a really simple thing, but it's actually interesting how often that's difficult. Um, you know, there's an example in our business where <coughs> we recognize that there's a lot of complexity in relationships between things and stuff. So we set up <coughs> a system and we called it the graph system. And the graph system has nodes and edges and all this kind of stuff. And we developed it and then later on I thought, well, actually 
would I talk to somebody marketing about a graph? You know, maybe if they really know Facebook well, maybe that makes sense. But it'd make more sense to talk to them about associations or relationships. Why didn't we call our system the relationship system? Um, so these are the things that we sort of learned along the way. So it's communication between all stakeholders that when you're talking, you need to talk about a context which is clear. Um, now, within there, we develop domain models uh, with a reference to the bounded context. Um, the bounded context isn't something that really sits in code. Uh, again, this is more domain-driven design terminology. The bounded context is supposed to say that within that context, any term you use is consistent. It's always that term. And I'll show you some examples in a minute, so it won't be all just theory. Um, <clears throat> now, domain-driven design also talks about domain models and what they contain. And inside them, they contain value objects. Value objects are basically things that you don't need to identify in, uh, in any way except by, by their value. Um, the classic example is, say, an address. So if I have an address class or object, it's identified by its address. It doesn't need to have an ID. That same address in two different domains will be the same address because it has the same value. Um, uh, value objects are kind of hard to get your head around a little bit at the start because you might be used to putting IDs on everything, but they're very powerful if you get them right because they can swap between domains and they're um, immutable and they're really powerful for performance and modeling. Entities is another thing they talk about. So entities, they need to have an identifier. And so they're things like, you know, a person needs to be identified, then therefore you need to have some sort of ID. Um, you can't just identify them on the value, like their name, because that is non-unique. But non-unique is not the only determinant. There are other things that determine what is an entity. And lastly, but the big one, is aggregate roots. Um, so a strange name again. The idea is that an aggregate root is an object that aggregates other objects. And the root is the one which is right at the top. The important thing with these guys is that all your actions happen with these guys, and they coordinate the other things. So they sort of, the value objects, the entities sit behind the aggregate roots. They're the chief, they're the boss. If you want to persist something, you persist an aggregate root. If you want to delete something, you delete an aggregate root. If you want to update something, you do it to that. Entities and value objects get updated, deleted, say all that kind of stuff as a consequence of dealing with an aggregate root. So it's another way of encapsulizing your um, software. Um, and the other thing I want to add is that aggregate roots emit events, and that's going to become important when I talk a little bit later about how we sort of knit this stuff together. The other part of, about this talk is command and query, responsibility, segregation. It's about splitting your system. So we write into our system via commands, and we do reading via queries. Now, that's where the CQRS part comes from, but there's, there's more, there's more to that. So, Commands are distributed via bus. Domain events are distributed by bus. Therefore, commands and domain events are really just messages sitting on a bus. Now, <coughs> the thing with CQRS and DDD is that there's a, there's a marriage here between these two patterns, and they really align really well together. It's this messaging marriage with commands and events. Events coming out of the DDD approach, commands coming out of the CQRS approach. They're both messages. And what's really important about this is that we start thinking in messages. Um, Alan Kay has said, the guy that you know, coined object-oriented, he said that he would have preferred to have called it message-oriented. Um, the reason for that becomes clear as you get into these patterns. You start thinking about messages more than you do objects. And uh, traditionally, a lot of programming is all emphasizing the object and, and what it does. But if you start thinking about the messages more, you get a nicer, cleaner architecture. All right. So how does this all help? Like, give me some sort of example I can, I can tangibly get onto. Now, um, <clears throat> the first thing is like, how do I learn, you know, what's an example? How do I learn to repeat myself? So this is a really small contrived example. And I have sort of intentionally not really gone in any sort of language, but it has some stuff. Okay, hi Doug, uh, we need to build a cinema booking application. Uh, we have our film goers, they can book a seat through our application, and before the film starts, we'll send them an SMS or app notification, tell them to get to their seats, let's send them a notification they change their password to, and that'd be nice. Let's do all these sort of things. Um, 
if you're starting out, you might, and I, this is very contrived, obviously, but for simplicity, but you might do something like, okay, great, we're doing a cinema app, we'll do a cinema app. And we have some user, they can register, they're gonna have to register, they authenticate, update their password, they might have some notifications, we had a notification, they might have some bookings, we had a booking. And these other classes, the booking class and the notification class might all sit in a cinema app. And this is all working really well, and I, if I update my password, I add a notification, you know, all that kind of stuff, it's all fine, it's all good. Okay. Now, uh, more requirements, please. Okay, this is what's gonna happen, obviously. Now, we want the SMS to go if they haven't logged into the app recently. Okay, yeah, it's fair enough, okay. Um, we also, ah, sorry. Oh, and our customers sometimes make group bookings. Can you just add that in as well? So, okay, no worries. Okay, so, right, this is what we had. You know, it's obviously contrived, it's pretty simple, but all the same, you might have all this in one package, that's pretty reasonable. Um, so, um, so we're gonna add it in here, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, well, we need to break it down. And again, this is just good object-oriented sort of methodology and that sort of thing, but uh, I think what with CQRS and DDD, it really drives you down this path a lot stronger, in a stronger way. Registration, authentication, that's some behavior that was going on there. Notifications was some other behavior that was going on, and bookings. Now, across all these things, we have a user, right? So that one user, maybe it should be three users. And this is where I'm really getting to about repeating myself. That one class that was really handy, that we used everywhere, we're gonna have to repeat it. So same user, multiplied. They're all gonna have the same ID. It is the same user. Um, they may even reproduce the same functionality inside them. If there's two classes, both user classes, they may even have some of the same functionality, um, but that's still valid for two different domains, and you do it, basically, you repeat it. There are ways around that, but in small doses is absolutely fine. So I've said, okay, we'll have a users package. Um, Register, authenticate, update password, that stuff happens. Okay, we've got a bookings package, and we have another user, class user. Same you know, IDs, they'll have the same IDs when, when they come up uh, from the database. And this user has a group, we've added that now. Um, and they have uh, bookings, and you can add a booking. Um, and we have a notifications package, and you can add a notification. Okay, we're sort of breaking that all up, but now you're like, well, uh, so I'm repeating myself. I'm also repeating myself, but I'm also I've got lost all that sort of ability to do something like update password, add a notification. That's gone. Um, so the answer is packages, packages, packages. Now, packages can mean lots of different things in different languages, um, but it should sort of mean like a business domain, uh, and like in PHP, it might mean a bundle or a library. It's definitely gonna be namespaced, right? In Java, it might be a, sorry, JavaScript, it might be like a bar update that you're gonna do, in a totally separate library. It definitely, well for me, it definitely means a different, separate persistent store. Um, I don't mean you don't, you know, we roll out different um, technologies, but I mean that they're gonna have their own persistent store. The only place they're gonna store their data, it's gonna be separate from the other places. In reality, it might all be the same database connection, but they're gonna have different, um, so the same connection to the service, but they may have different, they'll have different databases. That's the preferred way to go when you start out. It might be separate source control repositories for all these packages as well. Um, we're doing that. It's not absolutely necessary, but it does form another complete separation. The thing that's important is that they're independent and you can run all your unit tests without any other packages as long as those, you know, the dependencies are clear. So, but, 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 Whoa, spinner. Now how do we send the notification when they update their password? And how do we know when to send them a notification based on a booking? Nice one. Right, so this is when we start talking about more of the framework. Uh, again, very contrived and this is simplified, but basically, um, 
in your package for users. You might have an update password, and here we're going to raise an event. New password updated. Pass in the user ID. Um, this gets handled by the framework. It goes off somewhere. In bookings, we might raise an event saying, new bookings created in user ID. Maybe a booking ID is probably more appropriate, but maybe both. And somewhere else, like in the notifications package, and the way you structure this is kind of up to you, and this is uh, contrived, but you have somewhere else as a listener that's going to listen to this password updated. And with this, you've got an explicit dependency between here and there. But that's OK, because you've, you've said this is a dependency. It's something we have to do. And you've made it explicit. It's, you can, it's easy to reason about. A password updated events come in. need to handle that. We need to add a notification and fire it off. Yeah. So domains share pass information via commands and events. Um, in this example, I've created some events, but we can use commands as well. Uh, commands mean that the packages require an action to happen. There's definitely a package dependency uh, that way. Events are fire and forget. So the, other, the user domain fires those events, doesn't care, has no dependency. This one does depend on that one because it's listening for this event. But if the event doesn't happen, it doesn't cause a problem either. You just know there's a dependency there. Events and commands are messages with different intent. Um, listeners and handlers, such as this one, they live within the domain. Um, they pass responsive business objects in the domain. So the aggregate roots in domain-driven design parlance. So this is just a very quick example here. Now, The framework bus will find the right handlers, listeners for you. So with this example here, we've got, well, uh, the, the framework we use uses the fact that this is password updated is type hinted, meaning that when that event gets fired in that domain, it'll get past this event in this other domain. The framework will handle all that stuff for you. The same with the commands. If you create a command, send it off the other domains, the framework will find the handlers and listeners for it. And this is really powerful because it means things like um, we could just easily take this one out Nothing else is affected. Now, language. Let's return to that. I call everything a user. Well, that wasn't so good of me. In users, maybe we should call them an app user. In bookings, we call them a film goer. And in notifications, you might call them a recipient. Now, again, I'll just repeat, they're all the same user when it comes down to actual live production. When this one gets hydrated out of the database or this one, they're all going to be the same user. They're repeated. Yeah? But now we're saying, let's use language in the right way. Now, um, the difficulties with that is actually that you end up pushing language up. Now, what I mean by that is it's encouraging or it's good if you say back to the business, when we're talking about bookings, can we talk about the film goer? You know? because you mentioned that once, but you also mentioned customer once. Can we keep some consistency here? And that's when you're agreeing on ubiquitous language. You're saying, this is what we should talk about. It's going to make the discussion so much easier. When we want to improve something, and it's about bookings, let's talk about the film goer. But if we're talking about this other area, let's talk about the app user or notifications, let's talk about a recipient. Um, thank you. So the recipient, you know, for example, why is that important? Well. You might talk about recipients not wanting to receive too many notifications or notifications targeted at certain things. That language is context-specific and therefore for any context. So if this business decides they're going to do theatre bookings as well, that language and that functionality does not need to change. They're still talking about a recipient. Basically, any other packages you add in the notifications area, we don't have to mess anything else up if we change it. Right. So the language is really important here. Um, the other disadvantage of this is context switching. Fortunately, our brains are wired for language, but it's still something you've got to do, right? So you've got to context switch. I was talking about app use before, now we're talking about film goer. Same person, um, but different behavior. Okay, downsides. Right. I always think that all the presentations I watch or blogs I read, I find that they're so much more honest if you tell them what's bad. <laughs> And um, a lot of people just love to drink the Kool-Aid and say everything's cool. Uh, and then you actually get into it and you're like, oh, man, he never mentioned all the stuff that sucks. Um, 
you've got to write more code. There's lots of packages, bundles, repositories, databases that can mean lots of updates, bower updates or composer updates or whatever language you use. You've got to do the context switching I talked about before. Um, developer onboarding can be harder. There's new names for things, aggregate roots, and you've got to fire all these events. You know, some people, JavaScript developer might be cool with events because you know, we raise them all the time and we listen to them all the time. But other developers might find them a bit, you know, whoa, what's going on? I can't really get a handle on it. A um, few reference sites that are sort of implementing this stuff at the moment <coughs> or that I could find. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, but yeah, there's a few reference sites. So, you know, there's a lot of coming up to speed, um, but there's so many advantages. Benefits. So somebody joins the team and asks them to write, oh, we haven't written any unit tests for our whole domain. Write the unit tests. That person would look at me and run away or punch me or something. If I said write them for notifications package, that's so much more reasonable. You know, that's like, okay, it's well defined, it's a small part. I understand what it's doing. The actors in that domain, they're well named. I understand how they should behave with each other. The dependencies are really clear. Um, so it's really clear about what needs what. In, in my contrived example, you might not put the dependencies that way around. It might be better to have notifications not needing anything and having commands come into it saying send a notification. But whatever it is you do, it's very clear. Um, <clears throat> this is really straightforward progression to microservices when you want to, but you don't have to at the start. You can build it all uh, in one code base, but it's all nicely separated. And then one day you decide notifications needs to go to another server because you want to do that stuff offline. Um, you don't want to hold up the request doing that stuff. That's easy. Deletability. Um, Greg Young talks about this. He talks about the fact that are you going to be scared if you need to delete something? If you're scared or you're really worried about it, uh, then you haven't designed it well because you should be able to delete something and be fine with it. It's okay. So I could delete, say notifications, we decided, well, um, wasn't driving any use, people didn't like it, uh, let's delete it. You know, if in the first model we deleted it, uh, we'd have all sorts of issues. But with this one, when it's just listening to events, delete it, it's gone, who cares? Um, <coughs> swappability, same as deletability. If it's not the right language, well, let's say the language you've used when you started is the one that you're familiar with, but later on you realize that, hey, all that processing would be better done with uh, you know, Scala or Python. Well, don't worry about it, just change it, because that bit is easy to change. You should be able to rewrite your whole package within a week, you know, I think, it should be small. Um, <coughs> or not write the persistent store, again, doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm from the PHP world, <coughs> so <coughs> there's a whole long list of, uh, everybody's jumping on board, there's a whole long list here. Um, uh, Pre-Daddy is the one we use, it's excellent, I highly recommend it if you're doing PHP stuff. It's based from the Java world, so just go there and have a look and if you're using Java. Uh, you'll find a whole lot of uh, resources for that from there, but really Googling domain-driven design and CQRS is going to give you heaps of stuff. And there's a talk that I previously gave, which goes into the full request response journey for an API, talking about it all the way along. Um, I just want to say some thanks. Janos, who created that package, the pre-daddy one, Greg Young, Eric Evans, and Vaughan Vern, uh, Vernon are the people that have written the books and talked about this stuff a lot. Look them up. I uh, really want to thank the organizers too and the sponsors and you guys for coming along today. Um, now, I was told I've got five minutes, so if I've got a little bit of extra time, I will take you through that journey because I wasn't sure if I would have time. Yeah, now this is a bit more technical now. Um, uh, but it'll supply a bit of context to what we've just been talking about. Right, okay. <laughs> My great pictures. All right, so I'm going to start with the client. He does a request. Hello. Now, if you've used uh, MVC frameworks, they always come with these controllers. And this is a great thing about this architecture is it fits with MVC controllers. You basically adapt it and you change it. Um, the controller, though, is really skinny because all it does is post a message or this command message onto the command bus. 
Somewhere down here you have a command handler, which is subscribing to a command by you know, type hinting or whatever it is. You might do it by YAML files or, or, or any files, whatever you like. And it asks the aggregate root to do something. Now, this is what I was telling you before. Aggregate root hides all the details of what actually is happening in the business logic. You might talk to a value object, an entity, or another entity, which talks to another value object. And, oh, I, I did something. There's an event that fires off, goes on to this event bus. Okay. Um, in this handler, we deal with the object repository, whatever that persistence store. Now, for us, for example, we've done this, you know, we're, we started off with a more monolith type of, we, we were implementing this, but it's more monolith, and then I realized we can break it up with this model a lot more. So we now have lots of these domains, lots of these object repositories. If you look in our databases, all these databases, it's quite weird, but they all only have a couple of collections or tables, each of them. If you've ever looked at like Magento and their databases and stuff, you just look at it and go, oh my God, are you serious? I just think that this type of pattern can be applied to anything like WordPress and Magento, all that kind of stuff, and it'd be a big win. Um, <coughs> is it gonna change for me? Somewhere else, it can go into somewhere else, so some other domain. In CQRS you have, and I haven't mentioned this to any detail, but you can have a write domain and a read domain, taking it even a step further, so you might have a, a read model. And this is really handy for denormalizing stuff. Um, but you might have an event listener, and uh, it listens to this uh, domain event that was fired off in the other domain. Um, anything can listen to it, even this dog. Basically, it can be put onto uh, any MQ bus or uh, simple Q service, whatever you like. And again, we save the, the, uh, the, the read model. I think that's pretty much it for the journey, otherwise I'd just be going back into my presentation, but I just wanted to take you that. So that's the end. Thank you. Great. That's good. No challenges. I like that. Here. Oh, thank you. Remember our, our time here. Thank you very much. It will fit on a plane without any problems. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, thanks, guys. If you do have any questions you want to ask personally, ask me later on. No worries. Okay, that's the last one for this morning in here.